What's up, guys? James Blonde, Dizzy PW here, bringing you an interview with Mark Jacobs of City State Entertainment. And for the people that haven't been around in the industry as long, Mark, can you give uh, our fans a little bit of a background on what you've done? Oh, sure. So I've been making online games back before even most of the early BBS games. Uh, started doing them, uh, playing them, creating them, uh, really back uh, in the mid-80s. And, you know, knocked around a bit, ran my own service called Gamers World, which had a mud on it called Aradath, and then uh, a 4X game called Galaxy. Uh, designed and wrote those games myself. A um, couple years later, ended up on the General Electric Network for Information Exchange, uh, known simply, of course, as Genie. Uh, and I had uh, multiple games up there as well. And then in 1995, I founded Mythic Entertainment. Uh, we did a number of games um, between that and between then, excuse me, in 1999, including uh, Mage Storm and Splatterball and Aliens Online and Starship Troopers Online. And then in 1999, sold a bit of the company uh, for the money to create Dark Age of Camelot. 2001, the game re the game was released. Uh, we had uh, 18 months and only two and a half million dollars to develop the game. And obviously went on to be uh, one of the most successful MMOs of all time. It's still running. And certainly when you look at a, uh, an initial investment of two and a half and you had a quarter of a million subs at peak, was a very good investment. Um, 2006, we sold Mythic. Uh, to Electronic Arts. In 2009, uh, EA and I parted ways, and uh, two years ago, I co-founded a studio with uh, Andrew Meggs, who also worked with me at Troika. He worked uh, on Skyrim at, Beth I mean, uh, at Mythic. He worked with me, uh, I mean, he worked with Bethesda on Skyrim, and before that, he worked on Troika. And uh, now we're about to kickstart uh, Another massively multiplayer online role playing game. Sounds now, like a. Oh, go ahead, James. I was going to say it sounds like a good combination to uh, start up a new game. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I needed somebody like that. I don't. Pro First of all, I don't program anymore, and even at my best, I don't hold a candle to Andrew. I mean, Andrew is a Top Gun graphic guy, highly sought after. When he decided uh, to uh, leave Mythic. Uh, pretty much every big player in the industry wanted him. And so, you know, here's a guy with serious chops uh, and somebody I need, you know, as a partner. Because I can't do that. And I've, you know, frankly, always believed that you've got to find good people, you know, to do their jobs. Because you don't want to have to do theirs. Because if you're doing theirs, you're not doing yours. And so a guy like Andrew, uh, I don't have to worry about whether we're going to have a great you know, game programmatically. I know we will. I don't have to worry about, hey, what engine are we going to use for this game? Because Andrew's either worked on them before or has rolled his own or is simply smart enough uh, to deal with anything, frankly, that's out there. So, yes, uh, that he is a very good partner. Uh, frankly, uh, I wouldn't have started the studio without him. And I told him that as part of the recruiting pitch. That actually was going to lead me to my next uh, question is how long have you kind of had this idea for Camelot Unchained in the back of your mind? Like when you were touring around, going to all these conventions, talking about what was wrong with the industry, was it all just kind of like, I'm going to build up to this game that I've always wanted to make? Um, so yes and no. Um, no, not the um, boy expression of the idea that I would like to do something different. Um, you know, because I was thinking about various other IPs and, and other games as well. Uh, in terms of making an MMO uh, that is different from the current direction of MMOs, or was even different from the direction of MMOs back, you know, when we started work on Warhammer, yeah, kind of, absolutely. Um, you know, Warhammer, um, what was the right game uh, at slightly wrong time? Uh, when we began development. Uh, I'm not talking about the finished game. I'm talking about when uh, we went into development with it in 2005. 
Um, you know, WoW was obviously a huge success, massive. I mean, beyond what, you know, anyone predicted, even Blizzard. Um, and that and changes that occurred between really 2007 uh, until, 2000, until now, actually, have really changed how the MMO market is viewed not only by players, but by developers and publishers as well. And uh, one, of, one writer, I don't remember who it was, talked about uh, Warhammer and Conan and then Star Wars being really the last, you know, of these big budget, um, you know, triple A, more theme park, you know, MMOs, even though Warhammer obviously had a very strong RVR component. Um, and that if they weren't successful, it was going to be hard for anyone else to be successful. And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, Matt over at Venomax proves everyone wrong or proves a lot of people wrong. But the industry has changed an awful lot, you know, since uh, Camelot and especially since WoW. Certainly has. And I'd actually like to talk about uh, some of the foundational principles you've already released on your site. For our fans that haven't seen it yet, if you go to cityestateentertainment.com, you can read all about it there. He's got nine of them up. And it is a really fantastic read. I feel like you can make it into a textbook and put it in a college right now. But uh, one that really stood out to me was your foundational principle number three, which is something I've been following and writing about for as long as people have been listening to me write. And that's that there's just people went over the top with the tutorials and the hand holding. Somewhere around early 2000s, it just went too far. It's like, hey, auto click this. Hey, walk here. Now you even see games like, hey, click this and it'll kill the monsters for you. So tell us about how you're taking a different approach to this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, look, as one of those guys, uh, whether it was as Camelot evolved and uh, certainly with Warhammer, um, you know, I as a developer, along with pretty much everyone who's, well, almost everyone, who's developed a, 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 an MMO over the last decade would have to own up to you know, we were always trying to make it easier because what we were hearing from our players, or a lot of our players, was, well, we would like it, but, or we, you know, we really enjoy the game, but, and eventually you hear enough buts, and, you know, you start thinking, as a designer, you start thinking, okay, what else can we do to make it easier on the players? You know, what can we do to, you know, cut down on the parts that suck? uh in order to let them get to the fun parts and so you know there's been this never-ending cascade of features and approaches to to mmos um based on the fact that if we did certain things we would open the door to more and more players you know and they would stick longer was the theory um with camelot unchained which of course is a working title um we're not going to do that. We're going to go back to a bunch of old school things. So, you know, the whole looking for group thing, which obviously we were the first guys to put in uh, looking for, you know, group interface uh, back in, you know, the early Camelot days. Uh, that won't be in the game. The maps will be incredibly simple. You won't have, you know, arrows or question marks or, you know, other things to point you in the direction of, you know, where you need to go next. Because frankly, there is nowhere you need to go next. It's up to you. When you start the game, you know, of course, we'll have a basic tutorial because you have to. You know, you just don't want it to be long and you don't want it to be convoluted. But you have to give new players uh, some idea of what's going on in your game. Uh, so we'll have a very brief one. But after that, you know, <laughs> it's up to you. If you want to get right into the RVR, the RVR is going to be waiting for you. If you want to get into crafting, the crafting is going to be there for you. And it's also, you know, when you look at how this principle can apply to, you know, game systems, um, as opposed to just like setting and location and tutorials, a lot of it has to do with the whole concept, I think, of letting people make mistakes when they create their character. You know, we've always tried, you know, again, speaking for 90 plus percent of the developers, um, to prevent people from doing just that, as, of course, these games evolve. Uh, we're going to let people do that if they want. If you want to gimp your character, if you want to create a build that may not be optimal 
for doing, you know, what you think you should be doing. We're going to let you make that choice. You know, you're going to be warned. You're going to understand that, oh, gee, if I, you know, set my strength at three, uh, maybe I won't be so good at hitting things. But, you know, it's going to be your choice. And we're going to do that with a lot of other systems as well. Uh, we need to leave it up to the players, you know, to figure some things out. We're not going to tell them in RVR, you know, exactly where every battle is going on. Uh, that's what scouts are for. You know, that's what, you know, your friends, your guild uh, is for. It won't be auto magic anymore. So those are some examples. Very nice. And, of course, you're not going to let people be on both factions on the same server, so spying won't be <laughs> quite as simple. <laughs> no, no, not a chance. Not a chance. What? You know, uh, one realm uh, per server, and that's all there is to it. You can't buy your way into another realm. There's no way to, you know, be on uh, that other realm with one account. You know, one account, one, I mean, one server, one realm. Fantastic. And then back to your choices, not only are you going to have like the right and wrong choices, but you're looking to implement some kind of system into this game where people have two choices where one will give them a benefit in one situation while the other will help them with others. And you're talking about having different benefits for being male, female, tons of different races, types of classes. You do want to have a class system in this game. So can you tell us about uh, those choices? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, the easy one, of course, is the class system. You know, it's a question of whether you go with a mirrored approach of WoW and, of course, you know, Warhammer and other games, or you go with a rock, paper, scissor approach. We're going rock, paper, scissor. Uh, when we made the choice, or I made the choice, uh, frankly, can't blame anyone else for it, uh, to go with mirrored classes for war, it was because we were going, one, for a certain target demographic. We were looking for bigger numbers. I mean, it's really that simple. Uh, we weren't looking for the numbers that we're looking for today. We weren't looking for WoW numbers, God forbid, or anything close to WoW numbers. But we knew that if we wanted, and, you know, obviously EA <laughs> was firmly in agreement with this one. Um, if we wanted bigger numbers, we had to make some choices that would cater more uh, to a certain demographic, right? Uh, if you're going to try to reach... Uh, more than a niche audience. If you're going to try to reach people beyond the core RVR players, you have to make some, you know, some choices. And we were very honest with the players that, you know, look, they're going to be mirrored. They're not going to be, you know, rock, paper, scissor. Um, the other reason, of course, <laughs> was the nightmare that it was to balance all those races and classes in Camelot. Uh, as you remember, we had more race class combinations than, frankly, any other major MMO or even any MMO that I'm aware of even today. Um, and we're going to do the same thing with Camelot Unchained, but we're going to do it slowly. So our classes will be rock, paper, scissor. They will not be mirrors of each other. They will be different. I'm actually working on um, a principle right now which talks about this. We want people to look at our race-realm combination, I'm sorry, our realm-race-class combinations and be a little, I don't think frustrated is the right word, but have a difficult decision. We want them to look at, you know, what we're putting out there and go, wow, okay, so this one really does play a little bit differently than that one. Boy, I need to really think about it. That's exactly what we want our players to have to do. We want them to think about their choices. We don't want them to simply go, oh, yeah, it doesn't really matter. You know, if I pick country A or country B or country C, they're all the same anyway. So, you know, all the classes will be rock, paper, scissor. Uh, in terms of the race differences, that's another thing I believe in. And it, again, it goes back to that whole, you know, rock, paper, scissor. If you're going to go with that approach for classes, then why don't you do it for races? Why should all the races be homogenized? Why should they be the same? You know, why should my you know, Viking uh, warrior, you know, have the exact same strength, you know, as my Arthurian. Yeah, and I'm not using, obviously, the full, you know, individual race names yet, because we haven't talked about that uh, publicly. Um, you know, they shouldn't. We want to put these differences in there. And in terms of gender differences, uh, look, there are going to be some gender differences in the game, too. Now, 
we're not looking to put the player in a situation where, hey, if I play a girl, the girl is going to be gimped as a warrior right from the beginning. That would be silly. Okay, if we just said, oh yeah, girls are weak, you know, they should, you know, they can't be warriors. I mean, that's dumb. You know, of course we're not going to do that. But are there differences between various male and female races? Absolutely. Are these differences significant? Well, that's something we're going to be working with not only our backers on, but in, internally as well. So there will be some differences, some benefits as well you know, as some disadvantages. And I'm sure we're going to hear, you know, people complain on both sides, you know, of the argument. You're going to have some guys who like to play girl characters and who will say, hey, that's not fair. I want to play this, you know, four foot two inch woman wearing, you know, basically nothing, uh, going out with a huge sword and, you know, beating up on guys. And we'll also hear, uh, and we've already heard, obviously, some women, you know, kind of wonder where we're going with this. But we are going to make these, you know, choices, um, and we're going to allow players to make the choices. But they will be lots of advantages for women and some disadvantages for women. There'll be lots of advantages for men. There'll be some disadvantages for men. We also have a Bane and Boon system where after you create your character, uh, or most of your character, you'll be able to make some other choices that I think will also level out whatever statistical difference uh, or most of it at least, uh, that you might have encountered, or might be the result, excuse me, uh, of using the character creation system. So that if you really want, you know, to play someone who's, um, you know, male and weak, you can. And you can even take some, you know, banes, so you'll be even weaker in order to give you other advantages. And the same will apply to guys, I mean, to people who want to play uh, female characters. If you do want to play a race where maybe the women have a small statistical disadvantage than the men, you'll be able to do that. And you'll be able to use the, you know, Bane and Boon to get that strength up. And on the other hand, there are some races where it's not going to be the guys who are the weak, you know, weaker of the two. So it should be very interesting to see what people think once all of this gets revealed. It's hard to say how excited and refreshing it is to just hear a developer talking like this about a game that's coming out in the modern period. You, you would think there was never going to be a game like this before the industry has been going. But um, that said, uh, recently I got to check out uh, Bethesda Studio to see what they're doing with Elder Scrolls Online. And the back of my mind, and I kept asking them, they just kept going around about answers with me, was this is all great, but how are you doing the crafting system? It's key, how are you doing the crafting system? They wouldn't answer me. Seems like you have a pretty good idea for a crafting system in this game. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts so far? Oh, sure. Uh, crafting is crucial. I mean, you know, you can. There are some people, certainly, as we've you know talked about this on various forums, who think that you know crafting is isn't as important to an RVR system. On the other hand, I think it's absolutely crucial to an RVR system, uh, or RVR game like this. Um, when you look at where people normally get their gear in all the MMOs. Obviously, you always have the tension of, if it's a PvE game, getting it from, you know, raiding, getting it from completing quests, that's okay. If it's a PvE and RVR game, well, then you have the issue from, you know, players who don't want to PvE, if they can't get, it, you know, the kind of gear they want uh, from RVR just as you have PvE players who don't want to go into RVR necessarily to get the best gear, but they feel gimped because, well, you know, if I really had this, you know, fa fabulous sword, uh, then I'd be able to, um, you know, beat the boss a few more times or beat the boss faster. And so, you know, for this game where there is no PvE leveling component, um, either we would have to go the kind of lame... Uh, approach of just putting stuff in stores or, you know, even tying some rewards to what you do in RVR, or we go the smart approach. And the smart approach is by allowing people who want to be crafters to be full-time crafters and nothing else if they choose, to allow them as, um, to create items where they don't have to worry about the game. 
you know, and again, by the game, of course, I mean whatever, de you know, device or technique you want to use to get them their items, where the game is going to trump them. Because once that happens, then the crafters go, well, that's not going to work because, you know, if I spend a day making this sword and a guy can go get a drop that will give him a 10% advantage, he's going to go and get that, you know, the sword that gives him the advantage. And so, you know, we've told our crafters that point one, you know, of their, you know, plan to uh, help the game or to help, you know, to, uh, to build the game is that we will never trump what they can make. I mean, that's just, that is just a given. So everything is going to be created through our VR. You know, I'm sorry, for our VR. Uh, nothing will be dropped. Nothing will be acquired. Nothing will be found on any of the NPCs that are in the world. Um, next part of crafting for the for the, you know our hopefully you know future crafters is the idea that they can be full time crafters and nothing else. They don't have to go out and fight in RVR. They can participate in RVR. They can help by building things you know uh, within a new area or within an area that you've conquered or even in with even within the safe areas. They can go out and help. But they don't have to if they don't want to. They can sit and make whatever they want to make, um, you know, within uh, either their home city uh, or, you know, in some of the other areas. Um, another thing about crafters, you're going to level up your crafter about the same speed. You're going to, uh, non-crafters are going to level up their RVR characters. It is going to be slow. You know, the whole game is going to be slow when it comes to leveling. I think one of the worst trends that we've seen, and again, I have to plead guilty to this, along with every other developer of an MMO since WoW, uh, is making it too easy to reach level cap. Um, we're going to have a soft level cap for one, and it's going to be a slow level cap. I mean, a slow, slow leveling system. Um, so our crafters are going to know that if they put in the time to make a crafter, if they do what they need to do to level that crafter and get new skills and perfect them, that somebody just can't come into the game and, you know, have a ton of cash from his guild or from a friend, <coughs> dump it into a, a crafter character, and 30 days later, poof, they've now got as high a level crafter as the guy who's worked a year. So, you know, we're telling them that that won't happen, and it can happen. Because the way crafting works, it takes time. Money doesn't cir you know, circumvent that process. <clears throat> Another thing about crafters is, again, we want uh, our crafters to participate in RVR if they want to. So when you go out as a warrior, you know, and I'm, again, I'm using warriors generic, um, and you guys capture some territory, there may be benefits to the crafters for capturing that territory, special forges, special materials, you know, maybe even special, you know, techniques that they can use uh, to make items. Uh, the same with, you know, going out and helping to rebuild. Uh, you're going to have crafters who will be good at the more uh, militaristic aspects of crafting. And so maybe when you have uh, just captured a fort um, and you're, you know, trying to rearm it, if you can get some crafters there, who are very skilled, maybe they can do things to make the fort a bit stronger. Maybe, maybe, maybe they can up the guns a bit. Maybe they can make the doors stronger. Maybe they can, you know, lay traps, you know, for the enemy. So we want to get our crafters involved in a way that, uh, at least as far as I know, no other MMO has really got them involved. Exactly. It's always just been a side element and never a primary part of the game for probably 95, 98% of the MMORPGs out there. And um, with that, I also want to talk about one of your founding principles, number eight, that really has me excited, where you understand how important it is in a PvP game to have story-worthy events occur. I remember a long time ago, I was playing the original Guild Wars, and there was an event where we took on one of the best um, teams in the round, and it came down to me on a warrior versus one archer, and just because of the layout of the field, I managed to run through and take him down. And with the replay system, this became known as like, wow, do you remember that fight? 
So you're looking to not only want stories like that with your design, but you also want to have random elements where someone who normally would have zero chance of defeating somebody comes around and just makes this epic save and wins like a territory for their realm. Tell us about this. Sure. So there are a couple, you know, a lot of different components to that. Let's start with the whole concept of, you know, random uh, crits. So one of the things that we heard over the development of Camelot and obviously, you know, Warhammer as well, uh, were a lot of players saying they don't like randomness. Then, of course, there were players who were saying they like randomness. And this is an ongoing debate, obviously, you know, within MMOs and, you know, RPGs in general uh, on the computer side versus, you know, the less deterministic uh, systems, uh, pen and paper, where randomness has always been, you know, in most game systems has been embraced. Um, I want that randomness back. I, I, re I Maybe I'm going too, too old school and nostalgic here, but man, oh man, I remember so many nights gaming where, you know, I would roll divine intervention, okay? I was dead. The party was dead, you know, and we needed something really special to happen. And, you know, there, you know, the DM would allow us to roll for it. And those moments, as few as they were, were so awesome. And we talked about that for so long, being the geeks that we were, <laughs> that I want to see if we can recreate that. I want people to feel like, wow, okay, I was dead, and I should have been dead, and then something really tremendous happened. Now, obviously, that's also going to mean that somebody loses. And that's never any fun. I mean, you know, who cares? Nobody ever argues when you're playing a pen and paper game that the uh, NPC died because you critted, even though, you know, he had you surrounded uh, by 10 of his, uh, you know, fellow Urukai. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I understand that people will be upset about that at times. On the other hand, they'll be on the other end of the spectrum. They'll be the, on the other end of the roll of the dice as well occasionally. And if we can make it that interesting and throw in really random events, not just crits, you know, then people will talk about those moments. You know, we used to call them water cooler moments, you know, at Mythic, uh, as we tried to design certain, you know, things, certain quests. Um, and I want that with the randomness. And the same with, you know, critical failures. I mean, if you see a guy who's about to kill another guy and he trips and falls on his own sword, if we can bring that about, you know, obviously it's easy to do it statistically. Great, it's a random number generator. You roll some dice, you see what happens. But if we can put in the animations, if we can put in the effects we need, and you see that happen, tell me that you and the guys around you and your guild, and if you can, you know, obviously copy it, you know, uh, out to YouTube or to other places, that's something that you're going to talk about, you're going to think about, and you're going to laugh about. Even at times if you're the guy who fell on the sword. So... If we can do that, and if we can add randomness, and then even have more e crazy randomness, you know, the sort of, oh my God, why did this happen now? This makes no sense. You know, in the old Hollywood vernacular, uh, they used to call uh, the wild man a guy who was a writer who would come up with these crazy ideas. You know, sort of like, you know, you're walking across a bridge and then there's a gorilla on the bridge. Well, why is the gorilla on a bridge? You're in the middle of, you know, a suburb outside New York. Doesn't matter. There's a gorilla on the bridge. It's crazy. It makes no sense. But it's funny. And we want to do the same thing at times with this game. We want to be able to put that stuff in. That people will just be left scratching their heads. Because that's funny. And sometimes, hopefully, it will be poignant. And maybe, you know, even it will be scary. Or other times it'll just be friggin' cool. And if we can do that, you can end up telling a story without all the overhead that's involved in really telling a story or, or telling a story like many RPGs do. You know, if you look at storytelling games, obviously like SWOTOR and KOTOR and, you know, all the RPGs that have done a one Mass Effect and you know, that Bioware has done and, you know, other games have done, there's a lot of overhead involved. And 
you know, whether it's the localization, uh, whether it's the writing that you need, you know, to tell that story. There are some fabulous stories in all those games and in other games. But we're not looking to do that kind of game. But if we can end up allowing the players in a way of telling their own story, whether it is through random random events or occasionally these successes and failures or it's, you know, through the conquest and building up of these territories, if we allow the player to build their own story, give them the tools to do it and throw in some things as well, that will have, I don't want to say a greater impact because I don't know, I can't speak for any, everyone else, but that will have a significant impact on people and they'll see that as their story I think just as much as people who have run through some of the great RPGs have seen their single-player RPG story being their story. And on that thought, I can't help but wonder, do you have some kind of plan for using this chaotic element for your crafting system as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I think that our crafters you know, should have the same kind of risk rewards that our RVR players do. Sometimes stuff is going to go horribly wrong. Sometimes it may go fantastically right. And um, I think they were called uh, the one of a thousand. I could be wrong about this. The Winchester, you know, 73 rifles that, um, you know, it was in the movie Winchester 73. Uh, the idea that, you know, certain guns came out so well that, you know, everything was perfect, that they were more valuable. And I see that as being a reference or, you know, as a, uh, a bit of a signpost for what, you know, uh, for players in terms of how they can think about the kind of system we want to do. I want players to have that kind of success every so often, you know, so that all crafters, you know, can look at this item that they've just created. I know it's not going to be Excalibur or it's not going to be Stormbringer, but. It could be a really cool weapon or a really magnificent suit of armor. And by doing that randomly, by allowing these things to happen, as well as bad things to happen, those items become more prized, don't they? You know, they're not, oh, yeah, I know that if I make 50 of these, then one is going to be special. And then all the other crafters know that if they make 50 of those, one will be special. So those items aren't special. On the other hand, if it's truly random, you won't know when it's going to happen. You won't even know if it will happen to you. The only thing I can guarantee is it will happen to somebody. And when those items come out, they will be intrinsically more valuable, you know, both to the RVR players as well as to the crafters because they've just done something really special. And they'll be rewarded not only by you know, hopefully what they make for selling the item, but also because they now are one of those, you know, crafters who created one of these items. And so whether it's because, the, you know, uh, whether as an effect their leveling is a little bit easier for a while or some other reward that they get for creating this magnificent item, uh, we want to put that in the game and give it to the crafters as additional incentive, just like we do the RVR players. That's great. Um, James, do you have any questions for Mark? Well, I was actually wanting to clarify a little bit more on the, uh, uh, you said in your principles that there's not going to be a whole lot of PvE leveling and more uh, more s focused on the RVR-centric style game. And how, how does that actually work out? I'm a little confused on that. Did I say very little? I thought I said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um... So, um, let's, you know, again, let's be really clear about this. There is going to be no PvE leveling. That's just how it's going to work. You know, we've told our players that this is an RVR-focused game. Uh, I do not want uh, to create a PvE plus RVR game. I don't want to say ever again. I just don't intend probably to do one ever again. And I certainly don't want this game to be it. I think PvE plus RVR equals a headache. I, uh, you know, I said it when we were working on Imperator. I said it when we were working on War. It is nightmarish. And anyone who says it's not nightmarish is either lying or hasn't ever made one of these games. 
because every game I've seen that has RVR and PVE has gone through the same gyrations, you know, that we had to do of trying to keep the PVE players happy at the same time you're keeping the RVR players happy. And if there was no overlap between the two, that would be hard enough. But with the overlap you get, then it gets even more confusing. So, you know, right from the beginning, I said to uh, anyone who would listen um, that we did not want any PVE in this game. I just wanted to focus on RVR. So, you know, how is it going to work in terms of leveling? Well, it's kind of simple, actually. You know, if you think of players as NPCs, right, the other realms, and if you think of accomplishments the same way you would look at quests, then it becomes, you know, kind of apparent how you can do it, right? If you are killing other players, if you're conquering territories, if you're doing other things that you will be able to do in this game, you know, you're going to earn some rewards for it. I've also said that, for example, uh, you're going to level your stats not in the traditional or what is mostly traditional way, because obviously games like Ultima and other games use this as well. But you're going to level your stats by using your stats. So if you're a warrior type and you're swinging that sword, well, your strength is going to go up for a while. Again, soft cap system, so there'll be some diminishing returns, but you can keep leveling. You know, will there be uh, a final hard cap on stats so that you can, you know, just so you don't have anybody with uh, ridiculous strength a couple years later? Probably, you know, but I'm not 100% sure about that. I think using diminishing returns, we can make it so, you know, difficult to get those, uh, you know, uh, next points of strength that it'll be very hard for anyone to get, you know, totally crazy. Um, but you know, that's really how it's going to work. I mean, you're going to go out there in a system that's designed. So you're not always looking at your experience bar. So you're not looking over that hill for your next stat gain or your next skill gain. Um, cause I think that's part of the problem. I mean, I may be one of the few people who think this way, you know, but I, I kind of believe that as we've tried to make games less grindy, we've ended up making them feel more grindy. And, and it's kind of bizarre and maybe even batshit logic, you know. Uh, but I do think that as we've made these games so easy, uh, that people end up getting in the position of, wow, if I just do this and if I just do this and I just do this, I just that that's what they end up doing. They end up not looking at the bigger picture, not working necessarily with friends. Simply be focused on if I spend 30 minutes, I know I can get my next level. And if I spend an hour after that, I can get the level after that. And so to me, that makes it feel more grindy and not less grindy. And again, I, I may be one of the few people who think this way. Um, but we want to remove that from our game. You know, we want the players to focus on i don't know kind of having fun and <laughs> going out and doing things like you know beating their enemies into the ground like burning their towns you know like uh building their own uh like being rewarded for it without simply going okay my my experience bar is here and i know if i kill 10 more orcs and turn in this quest, and then I got the FedEx quest right after that, and then I got an oh, and I got another one that I know I can do in 30 minutes, you know, I'll ding grats. So, you know, we want to kind of get away from that. You know, we want to make it more like the pen and paper experience of, you know, you want to play, just play the game, have fun, and at the end get your rewards, you know, where it isn't just about, leveling and checking your bar every five seconds to see, you know, if you've leveled. As somebody who used to put a piece of paper at the bottom of my monitor to block my experience bar, I understand exactly where you're coming from on this. And, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is, 
I remember before I was even in gaming press, I used to watch your uh, Mythic YouTube videos of the week where you'd bring the guy and be like, this is the guy that didn't get your Warhammer element out on time, so I thought I'd bring him out here to make him uh, responsible for what he did. I was like, this guy is going to go about and make the game of my dream someday, so it feels unreal to be able to get to talk to you on YouTube like this. And I know I, for one, will be getting behind your Kickstarter. I've never done a Kickstarter before, so this will be my first. And what should... What do you want to tell uh, our fans that might be wanting to back your game about your Kickstarter and maybe some of the things they might get for joining in early? Sure. Uh, well, look, the first thing I have to say to everybody, you know, anyone who's listening, if you like this kind of game, if you want a game which isn't going to hold your hand, which is going to be a mixture of some old school elements as well as some new elements, if you're looking for that kind of game, you know, and you are interested in RVR, or you just want to craft, then I would love to see you look at, you know, our Kickstarter to see if you can uh, help back it. But if that's not the game you're looking for, please, you know, don't even think about it. I mean, honestly, we are trying to make a very tightly focused game. You know, we're not going to, you know, change our minds. We're not going to, you know, change the direction. Either this game is going to fund as the, you know, RVR game it is, you know, I want it to be, or it won't. So, you know, if you guys are looking for that, fabulous. In terms of rewards, we are going to try to be very generous when it comes to rewards. You know, right now we have a subreddit um, where we're talking to the players about not only the, and, and you know, and as well as on other places, where we're talking about, how the reward should be structured, uh, and what rewards you know they're going to get. And as of now, um, I've got a list of over fifty rewards that players have asked for, and you know that I find uh, acceptable in terms of you know they don't affect game balance because I won't allow any reward that affects game balance. You can't buy your way into a more powerful sword. Um, you know that can't happen. Not not with these tiers. Um, I'm not going to do that. That would be a violation of, you know, frankly, one of my core beliefs in the subscription model versus, you know, a play to pay, I mean, a pay to win free to play model. Um, you know, if one of the other things we're looking at as well is how to allow our players to pick their rewards. You know, so if you've seen the other kick, most of the Kickstarters, they're very structured. If you give us $50, you get X, Y, and Z. If you give $100, you get X, Y, Z, and maybe A. If you give us $150, you get X, Y, Z, A, B, and C. What, you know, one of the guys over at another forum uh, pointed out to me was that there are a very limited number of Kickstarters who've gone a different direction, where they have said to the players, hey, look, here are the basic reward tiers. And after that, we have a ton of rewards. Pick which rewards you want, figure out how much it will cost for those rewards, and add it to your Kickstarter. And I kind of like that, because it kind of fits with my whole choices matter. Uh, and it allows players to say, wow, you know, I really don't want some things that are important to other players. You know, just today, one of the guys in support of, of the Flexible said, yeah, I could care less about hats or glowies or, you know, special, you know, weapons. What I want is I want to buy extra digital copies at a discount. And, you know, other guys go, glowies? I want glowies more than anything else. And if we do it that way, if we do it in a very flexible way, then players can get that, you know, versus, again, the very structured one. But if, there, if you guys are listening to this and are interested, you know, head down to the Camelot Unchained subreddit, and you'll see us, uh, you know, talking about stuff there. Um, in terms of specific rewards, well, we're going to have some of the usual suspects, of course, uh, discounted boxes or discounted digital copies. Because we're an MMO, we're also going to have, you know, a lifetime subscription option that won't be available post-launch. Uh, we'll have discounted subscriptions, again, not available post-launch. And the key is, that whatever we're telling our backers for, you know, these rewards, they're only going to be for the backers. You know, we're not going to say, 
you know, six months later, oh, hey, you know, that lovely item that you got, we're now going to make it available to our players, the rest of our players. Our backers get backer rewards, and that's all there is to it. And those items, they become backer exclusive items. So, you know, we're going we're to try to be very creative. We're going to try to be very generous. The nice thing about not being the first Kickstarter is that we have a wide range of other Kickstarters to look at and use as examples. You know, so we, we know that, you know, what the, the wonderful guys at Obsidian, you know, did for their players. We know what Brian Fargo in, in Exile has done, you know, both for their other Kickstarter and the, the new one, which already funded, you know, in hours, you know, for the uh, spiritual success of the torment. Um, so we're going to be doing stuff like that. Sounds great. It sounds also like the snowstorm starting to turn our connection, so we'll probably uh, wrap up the interview now, but can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Oh, Darren, James, you are both most welcome. Happy to do this any other time. Uh, I love to talk. So yep. just let us know, and happy to do this again. Fantastic. We'll see you around, and good luck with Kickstarter. Yeah, good. best Thanks, of luck. Man. Best of luck. Thank you. All right, see you. Bye.